Welcome, everybody, as we uh, we continue. We, we started, of course, uh, a new season or a new session, the autumn, but uh, our fall session. But this, of course, is a continuing class. We haven't met for a few weeks because of Yontif. I hope everybody had a wonderful Yontif, a uh, meaningful Yontif, uh, a joyous Yontif, and we look forward to uh, to learning. We have many upcoming classes, a new series starting tomorrow. There's our next one, Rachel Danziger, Sharansky will be beginning, or Sharansky Danziger will be beginning her series on uh, on Genesis, the uh, beginning of human relationships. So that's tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thursday, Shuli Mishkin will be beginning her series on medieval medieval Jewry uh, between the Crescent and the Cross. Uh, her tours of Israel, or and um, then the next week, Rabbi Liebtag will be starting. We're starting a few more classes. Of course, watch your emails. And so it's a pleasure to have everybody. And like I always say, invite your friends to come. Invite a friend to come. Okay, as we start today, I want to thank uh, Stephanie Maganet and Morty, Morty Shapiro, who are sponsoring the class today in uh, observance of the yard site of Stephanie's father, Eliyahu Ben Levi Dov. I should have good memories. I know the yard site was a, a few weeks ago, sort of during our, our time lull, but I uh, should have uh, good memories and long life, and we should have uh, many occasions to celebrate the uh, happy occasions. And with that, Dr. Shapiro, with that longer introduction than usual, Vakasha, it's all yours. Thank you. So I'll go two extra minutes. Uh, glad to be back. Uh, a lot to do. Uh, uh, but because I only like to spend 15 minutes, no more, I like to spend 45 minutes on the new stuff. I won't get to everything. And thanks to all of the people who wrote to me. Just here's just some of the stuff I, I have to get to. So I'll just start at the top and I'll work my way 15 minutes through and then we'll stop and I'll continue uh, for next week. Uh, by the way, I saw I, I saw in the Jewish link that in Teaneck, uh, your Shalayim of New Jersey, they're, they're even having scholars in residence now. So uh, I can tell you that uh, I hope to soon have an announcement for Torah in Motion, an exciting announcement soon that uh, Baruch Hashem, things are changing. In terms of scholars in residence, uh, if your shul is open, I'm open. So uh, I'm waiting for those promised invitations to start flooding my mailbox. Um, I did not relevant to anything we're doing in the class, uh, except for the fact that I did speak to Rabbi Temler once about uh, uh, Rav Shaul Lieberman and Ramosha, et cetera. But I, we do have to acknowledge that uh, we lost another uh, great individual um, with, uh, Rav, with Rav Ramosha Temler. Um, I didn't know him that well. I was, I suppose, a speaker at Ishul twice, and I had conversations with them. Um, there's plenty of people here. You might even have people from his show. Suffice to say, he was a one of a kind. And um, obviously, he's an expert in uh, medical ethics. And uh, in fact, his um, his last article just appeared in the latest Hakira um, on uh, halakhic issues related to synthetic biology. Uh, he was uh, very active uh, until the end, and um, as I said, an expert in medical ethics. Uh, there's another, if you're not interested in that, there's another side to him. I'll just say he was a character. We all know that if you knew him. You know, the Torah says, Lo Saguru, rabbis are not supposed to be afraid. Other than Rabbi Tender, I have never known a rabbi, and this includes Gedol Yisrael, who was not afraid. They all are afraid. They're afraid of being attacked by the crazies, by the extremists. Rabbi Tender, Mamish, was not afraid, like nothing you've ever seen. And if any of you want to get a sense just of his personality, and um, I'll just call three things to your attention. I'm not going to play them for you in the interest of time, but um, let me um, show you three things here. Hold on a second. Uh, here, let's pull this up for you. Just on your own, you can look. The first thing is... Uh, well, first watch the, you can watch some of the Levali, in particular Ruven Feinstein. It's very interesting what Ruven Feinstein says and how he describes uh, the person he describes as his big brother. Also, uh, I'll get to what Rav Shabtai Rappaport says as well. But uh, I highly encourage everyone to watch um, Rav Tenler on the Temple Mount. Um, actually, let me uh, make sure I have a sound here if I want to play you something. It is, uh, it is, it is interesting. His his trips. He goes always goes, goes up to the Temple Mount when he would go to Eretz Yisrael. Rebbe, what what significance Alex? do you do you uh, give to that building? Does it mean anything to us? Is it is it at least a, a keeper on the holy spot? Is it something? According to our tradition, and there's a machlokes, of course, all traditions have machlokes because history lies. 
But this seems to be true. This was the base Kachi Kadoshim. Okay, so you can, uh, I highly encourage watching that. If you want to get a sense of the way he spoke, uh, I'm not going to play this. I don't want to get in trouble. But uh, during the brain death, uh, he gave it, this is 10 years ago, so he's not a young man. You have to listen to what he says about the English chief rabbinate, what he says about Jonathan Sachs. I mean, he, he calls it like he sees it. And then you can listen to another video, what he says about the RCA. Uh, it just, uh, he, he was a one of a kind. So let's leave it at, uh, at that. Uh, he, he will certainly be greatly missed uh, in the Orthodox world. Incidentally, since I mentioned the new Hakira, this is at the bottom of my pile, we're going to be talking a lot the next couple of classes on the Orthodox conservative relationship, a relationship that had uh, difficulties, but also could have close personal friendships. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that um, I've mentioned in the past, one of the things I mentioned was the relationship of Rabbi Soloveitchik to Rabbi Shubo. Rabbi Shubo, a big conservative rabbi in the Boston area, uh, in the book published by Natty Helfgott, uh, I, have it, I have it here. This book, I've mentioned it before, um, you have the letter that uh, the Rabbi Soloveitchik wrote to Rabbi Shubo's synagogue, explaining why he could not come to the, the event at the synagogue they launched the, they're launching this new Senate building and uh, he, he didn't want to give the impression that he supported mixed seating, but he wanted to honor Rabbi Shubo. In this new Hakira, what you have here is Rabbi Soloveitchik's Hespe, recently discovered. The family had it. The family is an Orthodox family in Israel. Rabbi Shubo's granddaughter is that Orthodox woman who runs marathons, if you can believe it. So Rabbi Shubo uh, has uh, or famous Orthodox uh, descendants, but when you read this eulogy of Rabbi Soloveitchik to Rabbi Shubo, Rabbi Soloveitchik was not a person who had many friends. People at that level don't have friends. It's very difficult because who friends can only relate. Lieberman was a friend of his, but friends, you have to be like on the same level. Rabbi Shubo, as he explains, was one of his dearest and closest friends. You write about how Rabbi Soloveitchik describes after his wife died and the body was still in the house, Rabbi Shubo comes over and the two of them recite to Hillam together. And uh, it, yeah, it's an un unbelievable um, description of Rabbi Shubo. And it's uh, as we go into this discussion of conflict and controversy, it pays to remember the Rabbi Soloveitchik who never wavered an inch on how to relate to the conservative movement, what he thought were halachic violations. Uh, in terms of friendship, uh, the, the two had nothing to do with one another. I want to mention, going back to Rabbi Tenwar for a second, because we spoke about this last semester, we spoke a good deal about Rav Shaptai Kohen Rappaport, we spoke about swordfish. Rabbi Tenwar, one of his great contributions, if you think it's a contribution, is he's the reason we don't eat swordfish. This goes back to 1951, the OU published a list of kosher fish, and whereas the old Agudas Rabbonim list from the 40s permitted swordfish, and in Eretz Yisrael they permitted it, uh, Rabbi Tenwar said no. And that then became his uh, claim to fame, or one of his claims to fame, that you can't get any swordfish anywhere. Uh, we, we spoke about even though Refreshal Shachter thinks it's permissible, which it's hard to see how we can ever go back to swordfish because um, we haven't done it for so long. However, if you listen to the Hespade, Hespading, you will hear Rav Shaptaiko and Rappaport describes how he examined a swordfish and he saw that there were scales and he called Rav Tenler and Rabbi Tenler said, well, if there's scales, then you can eat it. So I'm thinking this is Rabbi Tenler changing his mind, his crusade of 60 years, or 50, 60 years. And, uh, but no, it wasn't because uh, you can go on YU Torah and you can see Rabbi Tenler. He actually must have retracted that again because he has a shear there. Affirming again, this is just from a few years ago, uh, that swordfish is forbidden. He goes after Rav Shechter. I'm not gonna repeat what he says about Rav Shechter. And, uh, uh, after he's Rav Shechter's Rebbe. Rav Shechter is one of the people who gave the Hespades. But, um, you know, in Rav Tenler's mind, if you speak falsehood, and uh, especially as his Rebbe, he can call him out for it. But I want to show you something very interesting here. I contacted the swordfish expert, Rabbi Ari Zivotofsky. It was Rabbi Ari Zivotofsky who brought the swordfish. I should have realized who else walks around swordfish. And let's look at this one minute. This is, uh, you will see, Rav Cohen examining the swordfish. Now we're going to talk later about the swordfish as well, I think, because this becomes an orthodox conservative dispute. The swordfish becomes identified with Isaac Klein, who wrote the responsum permitting it, and conservative Judaism accepted it. 
And orthodoxy becomes identified in America, at least, with Rabbi Tenwer forbidding it. And uh, you, you couldn't permit swordfish because that was the, in fact, that's Ari Zivotofsky's whole point. By definition, once it came into the orthodox conservative dispute, we couldn't permit it. We'll see something very similar with prenuptial agreements. And the opposition to the Lieberman Ketubah, as we'll see, was responsible for 30 years till it, the Orthodox came around to the prenuptial agreements. We'll get to all this, but I think you'll enjoy what I'm going to show you now. Rav Shapte Kohen Rappaport, uh, Rabbi Moshe's uh, grand, uh, grandson-in-law, Rav Tendler's son-in-law. Uh, here's the video of him examining the swordfish. Let me play it for you. I don't know why I'm not getting the sound. Um, it's not I'm going to have to. Enough. I'm going to have to pull it up again right now because you want to see this. Uh, I'll pull it up, and that'll be the last thing I think we do. Um, um, and then, yes, okay. Now you're going to be able to see it. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, hold on. Now it's going to play. Um, let me pull it up for you. Um, that's for some reason on Zoom. If you um, if you leave a video for too long, it uh, you lose it. Um, but here it is. Watch this. Oops. Wait, 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 wait. It looks like a scale. It's like a scale. So, okay, so here it's full. He has all along the belly. Mm -hmm. Danny, do you remember where they are? Uh, no, what do you think? I think it's, I don't know what you want in the end. So that's, listen, that's a scale, that's that's a scale right? Let's so, see, so let's, 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 so uh, there you see it, Rav Shapte Akon Rappaport saying about a swordfish, me'achuz, it's kosher, not 95%, 100%. So uh, let's leave that in abeyance. Let's continue with what we are doing. Uh, actually, I have one more minute. Let me tell you, show you one more thing uh, about the Harry Fisher Institute. And then I'll get back to the Shabbos tshuva. I have information, uh, people emailed me about the driving on Shabbos. I just want to show you something which someone sent me. Uh, believe it or not, look who uh, gave a shear at the, um, this comes from Dovi Safir, but someone sent it to me. Rav Soloveitchik, when he went to the land of Israel in 1935, when Lieberman was the head of it then, he uh, gave a shear at, um, a sh at uh, Harry Fischel. So, um, Let's, uh, let us return now to uh, what we're going to do. Uh, incidentally, I should also say that um, someone um, from the family wants me to emphasize there's some other important books they published. So, for instance, this one, Tosfos Hashalim, which is uh, all on uh, Torah. They collect all the different uh, Bale Tosfos. Uh, they've also published uh, Birkas El Yahu, which is an important commentary on the Vilna Gons commentary on uh, on the Shulchan Aruch. But all of these things, they're not academic. They're important works, but they're not the sort of academic stuff that Lieberman was interested in. So I'm gonna leave all the stuff, um, the other stuff uh, for next class, including about, uh, I contacted Rabbi Heshi Billet. I know the story behind, some of the story behind Rav Meir of Eisenstadt's grave, uh, the Shabbos, the driving on Shabbos uh, tshuva, Robert Gordas, what he had to say about it. And, um, the details of who signed this tshuva. I want to explain this to you. Maybe we'll get to it today. Stuff about the traditional movement. I turned to Zev Elif about it. I have some good stuff about that. Um, and um, okay, uh, stuff about the Mishnah Brura, uh, the Chavis Chaim, Lashon Hara. If the person doesn't know you said it, you have to ask Machila, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of stuff. So I'm putting this away. 
because I could spend the whole hour doing this at the end when we're done the class, maybe another five classes or so. If we have everything that's uh, built up, then we'll we'll get to it. I want to return now because we always have good stuff in and of itself. Uh, with our story with the great Rafshal Lieberman, let's pick up where we left off. If you recall, and everyone who wants to see the prior classes, because it's a new semester, you can go on the Torah in Motion website. It's very easy if you want to walk and listen to it as you walk. Very good. You can go on YouTube. Just uh, go to YouTube and plug in Torah in Motion. And then when that comes up, just plug in my name, Mark Shapiro, and you'll come up with all the Torah in Motion talks. Or you can just uh, YouTube. If you're just interested in Lieberman, not the last series or previous classes, just uh, search on YouTube, uh, Mark Shapiro, Shal Lieberman. You'll get the five previous classes. And if you do that, you'll see the last class. The previous one is, and, and I keep referring to earlier classes. It's like uh, we've been going now for, uh, what is it, uh, 14 years or something. So when I talk about what we've done previously, it could mean last semester, it could mean five years ago. And only a few of you have been with us all this time. So, but still, uh, I like to make those references. The last thing we did is I believe, I believe is that Lieberman leaves Eretz in June of 1940. He travels East, stops over in India, and then he makes his way to the United States uh, from the Pacific side, Pacific Ocean. Now, originally, Lieberman was only supposed to come for a few years. In fact, the contract is only one year to be renewed. But this would turn into a permanent appointment. He would remain in the United States uh, for the rest of his life, except for one year, as when he uh, uh, taught in, in Eretz Yisrael. Lieberman never imagined he was leaving Eretz Yisrael for good. We have letters of him, for example, to uh, Sholem and uh, his other comments he makes, that he always assumed that he'd be returning. After all, who, who leaves uh, the land of Israel never to return permanently? So it was a temporary uh, visit, but the temporary visit turned into much longer. Of course, his wife also was um, very much a, much more of an American, and she had a very important job. And he also had a, even, you know, he loved teaching at the seminary, as we'll see. Uh, so there was reasons why he stayed here. In the 1960s, he actually mentions, Spiro, uh, they mentioned in the book Spiro and Shochet, that he wished to return to the land of Israel, but by then he felt the responsibility to Finkelstein. He, he, as we'll see, he had become the rector of the institution that he didn't feel, Finkelstein was so good to him, he didn't feel he could leave him in the lurch. Now he's appointed <clears throat> when he comes here as a professor and what's the title? He's given this fancy title, Prof not, not Magid Shir or Rosh Hashiv, anything like that, Professor of Palestinian Literature and Institutions. That's uh, the fact that he's such an expert in Yerushalmi. So, I mean, they could have called him Professor of Babylonian Literature because before he's an expert in Yerushalmi, he's an expert in the Bavli, but that's the title they gave him. Professor of Palestinian Literature and Institutions. Uh, if you look in the Spiro book on page 40, you have a letter, which is from 1941, a year, less than a year after his arrival. And this is what Lieberman writes to Finkelstein about that uh, Finkelstein tells him that we're now making, you know, you, I want to make you a permanent member of the faculty. He says, it goes without saying that I consider it to be a great privilege to be able to spread the Torah in this great house of learning under the present favorable circumstances, particularly when the head of the school happens to be a great scholar in the same branch of learning to which I wrote in my life. But look what he says. I consider it a privilege to be able to spread the Torah. He sees himself as teaching Torah as it's a religious angle as well, not just from a scholarly perspective. And as I said, he was, would remain the rest of his life here, except for one year where he taught at the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies at Hebrew University. In 1959, he's appointed rector of the rabbinical school. That means now this is gonna lead us to even more problematic from the Orthodox perspective, because he's not just teaching. The seminary has always had Orthodox teachers, but now he's giving the imprimatur, he's, he's signing the smicha, uh, so in a sense that he is really involved in the movement, despite the fact that he'll consistently claim he has nothing to do with the movement, he's just a Muhammad, he's just a Torah teacher. He didn't use the word Muhammad. I, that's a, uh, those who know Rabbi Soloveitchik's famous line where he says, I'm a Muhammad. So that's what Lieberman was saying is I'm a teacher of Torah. The Rav liked using the term Muhammad. Um, so he's, he's involved in administration, although Finkelstein, he tries to shield him as much as he can. Because what, when Lieberman is going to spend his time doing busy work? That's what administrators do uh, often. And um, Lieberman should be uh, learning and it should be writing. But uh, as part of the agreement, making him the rector of the institution, 
he, his job was, quote, to guide the general religious policy of the institution. You'll find that in Spiro on page 28. So on the one hand, you could say that's a good thing. He's guiding it. On the other hand, then again, that opens him up, and I think fairly, to orthodox critique that if things were happening that uh, were not in line with what the orthodox said, he has to have some responsibility, if that's his job, to guide the uh, general religious policy of the institution. But the old question is, which we'll see is, was there anything at the seminary in opposition to orthodoxy? That is, in terms of the rabbinical school, were they teaching things against halacha? We know that the rabbis were doing things against halacha. We know the rabbinical seminary were, assembly was doing things against halacha. But can you point to things at the rabbinical institution, this at the rabbinical school? There's this weird connection. The seminary is an independent academic institution. It also trains rabbis. But it has its own administration, and uh, it's not. It, it functions separately than the uh, the rabbinical assembly and the rabbis outside in the field. So we'll see how this plays out as well. But the first thing we need to do is speak about the orthodox response from Lieberman coming to the seminary. It's, uh, I'm going to summarize and add new material to material that's in my little book here. I call it my kuntras. So Lieberman and the orthodox. This uh, I. Uh, where did this come from? Well, um, first of all, I, 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 this is how I introduce it. Uh, on April 18, 2005, I was privileged to deliver the annual Saul Lieber Memorial Lecture sponsored by the Union for Traditional Judaism. I thank all those who made the event possible, especially Rabbis Kenneth Green and Ronald Price. And I see Rabbi Kenneth Green is right here on the screen with us. So he, he and Ronald Price get the credit for this work, which uh, I had so much fun writing and uh, University of Scranton Press sold like a thousand copies of these. I give it away free now, and it's um, uh, it, it was great. So the opportunity I was asked to speak, um, I wasn't even asked to speak about the relationship to the Orthodox. Just uh, I guess because I read about Rebbe of Weinberg and uh, Lieberman is also that sort of figure between two worlds. But I had always seen over the years references in the Orthodox, and I thought, well, this will give me a good opportunity to speak about the attitude of the Orthodox. And then I decided to put it together in a little volume, including an English a Hebrew section. You can get this, as they said, for six dollars on Amazon. And uh, if you see me, I'll give it to you for free. Uh, and. Um, really enjoyed uh, writing it. So let's speak a bit, a little bit about that. Uh, and to this day, constantly people are speaking to me about uh, Lieberman and the Orthodox. And sometimes they know nothing. There's this, uh, he'll remain nameless, but a rabbi, he's got to be like in his 80s right now. When I was at his show, he even said to me, did Lieberman know Bavli or only Yerushalmi? I mean, just think of that. And then you'll meet people from the yeshiva world who know a lot, who uh, they have all the sorry. But you'll meet some other people who are so ignorant. It's a yakam dor chadash. They 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 think that Shal Lieberman that uh, maybe he knew a little, you know, but God, what could he really know anything after all? He taught at the the seminary, and I know conservative rabbis, and they're amaratzim. So uh, you know, their attitude is that a typical guy, Lakewood, twenty two year old guy, knows more than this so called Shal Lieberman. And if I tell these people, I say to them. I'm going to tell you something right now, and don't take my word for it. Ask your Rosh Hashim, the whole agree. Shal Lieberman knew more, knows more than anyone in Lakewood now, any of the Rosh Hashiva, and I'll say that even during the days of Ravaron, in terms of just sheer knowledge. And I say they will agree with me if you ask them. Uh, I'm not talking about Lundus, but in terms of, so there's, a, we're living in a new generation. But when Lieberman came to the seminary, remember, he was the great Eloi from Jerusalem. The one who learned Becharusa with Rav Cook, who was close to all the Gedolim, who was head of the Harry Fisher Institute, which was the uh, Beit Midrash for what's thought to be the best and the brightest of the, um, the Talmud scholars in Eretz Yisrael, who had an academic uh, sense. And now he's coming to the seminary. At the same time, as we'll soon see, that there's a battle going on in the United States between orthodoxy and conservatism. By coming to the seminary, Lieberman, he might not have realized this when he made the decision to come when he was in Eretz Yisrael, but when he, once it, he was in America, it wasn't that long before he realized it. And he did understand that it would be a little bit problematic. I'll explain to you why in a second. But his relationship with the Orthodox would forever be changed, in the sense that um, you no longer will have his farim in a typical yeshiva. The, the Rosh Yeshiva might have it, but it'll have it hiding maybe in the corner, things like that. It was also... A, Orthodoxy's loss is a major, if you're going to term it that way, is a major coup for the seminary. For its Talmud faculty, now towered over any other institution. 
um, any other academic uh, institution. Um, and you had it all the, um, you used to have Hebrew colleges then, and you have, of course, you have Hebrew University, and you have the rabbinical schools in America. They all have academic Talmudists. But to have Ginsburg and to have Lieberman in one place, they, uh, they really are, and not to mention Finkelstein, uh, um, that becomes the center for the study of Talmud. But Finkelstein wasn't done yet. Believe it or not, after World War II, when Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg is in uh, Switzerland and Montreux, Finkelstein turns to Weinberg and invites Weinberg to come. He, <laughs> Finkelstein would spare no effort to bring the best scholars in. And Weinberg writes, he writes this to Shmuel Atlas, another academic Talmudist, who was first at Hebrew Union College and then later in, uh, first in New York, a uh, Jewish Institute of Religion, where uh, Shubo graduated from, and later uh, at Hebrew Union College. He could graduate Jewish Institute of Religion, become a reform rabbi or a conservative rabbi. Weinberg writes to uh, Atlas, why does uh, Finkelstein want me to come to the seminary? He already has two great figures, Ginsburg and uh, Lieberman. But well, Yechayak of Weinberg, was, he wasn't going to sever his ties with the Orthodox world, so he would not go. Uh, but you understand why Finkelstein would turn to Rabbi Weinberg. If Lieberman, who wasn't just an Orthodox figure, he was a Rosh Yeshiva, <laughs> close to all the Gedolim, if he agreed to come to the seminary, then maybe Rabbi Weinberg would. Uh, Lieberman made it his goal to bring in Dafka Orthodox scholars to the seminary. He asked many people. He asked um, Rabbi Pinchas Hirschsprung. This is recorded in the Spiro book. I even heard it from Dr. Judah, uh, who I think needs your full shame, Rabbi Kelman said in Toronto, but the Rabbi Hirschsprung's son-in-law, Rabbi Hirschsprung, uh, Dr. Judah was quite close to Shaul Lieberman. He told me they vacated once in Florida, Shaul Lieberman vacation with them together in Florida. Um, Rabbi Price, as I recall, he also asked him. R Diane Grunfeld of London. Lieberman, uh, Rabbi uh, Epstein. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, what's his name? From, uh, Isidore, Isidore Epstein, right? No, not Isidore Epstein. Uh, the, uh, the great, the grandson of love. From, from England. Shah. No, no, from, uh, from Queens, from Shara Torah. That, that I don't know. Uh, Rabbi, someone will do it in the comments. Uh, Rabbi uh, Zelg Epstein, Zelg Epstein. He's the only one who defended Rav Nussan Kamenetsky publicly. Rabbi, he asked Rav Zelg Epstein. So Rabbi Lieberman asked, wanted to get all the different Godolim to come. Um, almost all of them said no, but he was successful. He did bring some in. He brought in Dimitrovsky. We spoke about Dimitrovsky. Um, he brought in Shraga Abramson. Shraga Abramson uh, comes from the same town in Europe uh, as Rabbi Chiyak of Weinberg, uh, Chekhanovich, expert on the Gaoni, but he knew everything. Uh, his son-in-law, incidentally, is Elisha Anshalovitz. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, he's a well-known teacher in, uh, for the people, for in Eretz Yisrael. I think he's at, uh, is he Mali Gabo? I'm not sure. Uh, Eliezer Shimshon Rosenthal, although I don't believe Eliezer Shimshon Rosenthal was permanent, um, maybe it was. So maybe someone at the seminary can uh, recall that. I think he just would come um, on occasion. So hold on a second, I'll show you a, a picture of, uh, have, uh, here he is. Um, and Lieberman was actually quite close to Rosenthal. And uh, when Rosenthal died, he died young, he was in the middle of working. I have it here. He was working on this volume. Can you see it? Yerushalmi uh, Nezikin, from a new manuscript. Um, with, and he died. So uh, Lieberman finished it off. Lieberman has a whole commentary here on Yerushalmi Nezikin, based on this manuscript, Baba Matsya, Baba Kama. He says he's a Torah and Derech Eretz uh, person. He taught at the seminary. Although Professor Sperber told me that uh, when the seminary tried to get him to come, and this maybe is later, I think, uh, this would have been the 70s, this maybe explains Lieberman's answer. Um, he spoke to Lieberman about it, and Lieberman told it, it's not for you. So I think perhaps by the 70s, Lieberman already saw the direction the seminary is going, so he advised someone like Sperber, this isn't a place for you. Uh, we have already mentioned, although Lieberman, as far as I know, had nothing to do with this, Abraham Sofer. The person who published the Me'iri, that's in every single yeshiva in the world, has the Me'iri. Uh, I'd have to get up and get it, so I don't need to show you. Take my word for it. He published it. It's on the opening. Uh, you open up, it's Avram Sofer. Look in the end of Chibur Shuva. You even have Louis Levy, Agon Levy Ginsburg's uh, notes there. Uh, uh, he taught at the seminary, although the 
supposedly because of his family's strong opposition historically to rabbinical seminaries. In Hungary, they hated rabbinical seminaries. He only would teach in the teacher's institute, but he taught women Gemara. How do I know this? Because Halivni told me he used to substitute for a sofer. And uh, he, he would, uh, and he would, so he would teach women Gemara. I don't think his ancestors who were opposed to rabbinical seminary would have been so crazy about him teaching women Gemara, but he, he, so he taught in the teachers in the soup, but he taught at the seminary. So you had many, many Orthodox figures uh, teaching at the seminary. Nevertheless, this was, it was a time of increased battles. What, what was the battles? Well, because at this time, both Orthodoxy, what does it mean Orthodoxy? Orthodox synagogues that belonged to the OU. We, the synagogues might look identical. We're gonna speak about this as well. Uh, but uh, institutionally, Orthodoxy versus conservative Judaism were battling, competing for the loyalty of a large segment of the American Jewish community. What do I mean by the synagogues with identical? Finkelstein. Finkelstein comes out of the seminary. He graduates from the seminary. He becomes rabbi, I think, in 1919 at a synagogue. It's called Kehilath, Is Kehilath Israel. I think that's what's called in the Bronx. It has a machitza. It's an orthodox synagogue for all intents and purposes. And that's not the only one. There are other synagogues like that. These synagogues, they interviewed musmachim from both the seminary and from uh, Yeshiva Shabbat Shalchanan. Whoever they liked better, they took them. And the service was the exact same. Everything was the same. So, but the synagogue then would join, let's say, the uh, United Synagogue. I don't know. Maybe Knesset Israel like, always called an Orthodox synagogue because that's how it's always called because that, the women sat up in the balcony. But if that was a member of the United Synagogue, which I haven't been able to determine, then it would be a conservative synagogue. A conservative synagogue is not to have machitz also. And uh, well, yet, or, so there wasn't, what was the difference here? Um, uh, in terms of how most of the synagogues functioned, there wasn't much of a difference. And then you're going to tell me again, well, the... Um, the conservative synagogue could have mixed seating, but we'll see. I'm going to give you the figures today. The Orthodox synagogues also had mixed seating. So there was a, if you look, let's say in the tens and the twenties, um, a lot of similarities in the thirties, of course, I mentioned Bernard Drachman. Bernard Drachman, I think I might've implied that he was working at the seminary when he was president of the OU. It's not the case. He leaves, he leaves in 1909, which is still fairly early. Hyamson remained there. He was the rabbi of Orthodox synagogue and he was teaching there, but, uh, it, supposedly, Drachman already in 1909 saw that there it was he didn't like the move the way he was moving as a conservative institution. Now, I, I don't know if that's the case or if there was conflict with Donald Schechter. Whatever the case is, there wasn't that much different. And you could go to a conservative synagogue, you can go to an Orthodox synagogue, but these were competing institutions, and the ideology of the of the seminary with Solomon Schechter, for instance, Catholic Israel versus uh, Yeshiva Shrivitz Ochana, which is real yeshiva. Uh, there would be differences there. So you see that you want to grab the loyalty of the people. What happens in the 30s, though, is, is something new, brand new. The conservative rabbinate had recently begun to assert its independence in terms of halacha. They never did this before. They never uh, were deciding halacha questions. That you went to uh, post king. Conservative rabbis went to post king either. They can go to Ginsburg. Or they can go to uh, the local rabbi who's a Talmud Chacham from Europe. Many of these conservative rabbis could go to their fathers. Uh, Louis Finkelstein go to his father, of Yitzhak Finkelstein, the big rav. Uh, Israel Leventhal, leading conservative rabbi. He can go to his father, Bernard Leventhal, the leading rav of Philadelphia. Do you know how many Orthodox rabbis had uh, children who, um, uh, who went to the seminary? Uh, so the, a real connection. But what do I mean when they started asserting its uh, decision-making? I believe... You first see this with the issue of the Aguna. Uh, the Aguna was a problem already after World War I. Um, there's all sorts of upheavals. It was a problem before, even before that. Uh, if you look at the Hebrew newspapers from the uh, 19th century, Hamagid and all the rest of them, you, almost uniformly, every week you'll have a, an ad there. Um, my husband left, uh, from, let's say, come from the village, uh, Novozipkov, let's say. My husband left six months ago. He went to America. He hasn't been heard from since, uh, you know, my or my daughter's uh, husband departed. We haven't seen him in two years. Uh, you, know, you have all these uh, stories. Uh, someone needs to go through these newspapers and try to you know, see if they can come up with some sort of article here describing uh, the situation, how they tried to solve the Aguna problem. But by the 1930s, the conservative rabbinate feels that the difference between them and the Orthodox rabbinate is that the Orthodox rabbinate is old-fashioned, they're European, 
they're um, they're too conservative. They're not willing to uh, use halacha to speak frankly to use halacha the way modern Orthodox rabbis today use halacha. Nothing the conservative rabbis were saying were out of the fold. What's out of the fold is that uh, they didn't. We'll see. They did not accept what the Gedolim in the end said, but uh, they were doing exactly what modern orthodoxy said that we should be doing. That is working within a Lachic system. That was what's going on in Germany. And that's it has been going on since there's been a modern orthodox movement. Uh, that's why if you look at, look at early conservative Judaism, and we'll see when we finish, when we go on to a new semester, that won't be the next semester, I want to do the early reform movement, the first generation reformers also have a lot in common with modern orthodoxy. If you read their descriptions of what they're trying to do, they sound just like uh, Rabbi Norman Lamb and would uh, sound uh, 40 years later. But what was the first, what I think is the first um, example of this? Rabbi Louis Epstein, well, let me show you who Rabbi Louis Epstein is. I, I couldn't find a picture of him. Um, Believe it or not, I could not find a picture of Louis Epstein online, but um, you have lots of articles. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. No, uh, this is his father, Rabbi Louis Epstein's father. Louis Epstein, um, when his father comes to America, becomes a leading rabbi in Chicago, not to be confused with Rabbi Ephraim Epstein. I'm not sure if they're related, but uh, Louis Epstein remained in Slobodka, where he learned. Um, yeah, you can see lots of articles on him. So it says, for example, he becomes rabbi after graduating the seminary. He's in Dallas, Ohio. And then he's in Roxbury, Beis Medrash Hagado in Roxbury. Beis Medrash Hagado certainly had a machitza. What's better Beis Medrash Hagado in 1918 doing hiring a guy from the seminary? Because again, they would interview people from the seminary and they'd interview people from Yeshiva Shabbat Zalchana. The religious makeup was identical often. I, I mentioned Bernard Drachman. Bernard Drachman studied in the, in the Jewish Theological Seminary in Breslau, which is uh, the, the German equivalent of uh, the seminary uh, um, in, in New York. And then he becomes rabbi of Kehilath Israel in Brooklyn. Kehilath Israel still exists. I don't know if when he became rabbi, what the situation was uh, with uh, men and women sitting together or separate without a machitza. It would be interesting to know. Uh, it's soon is a synagogue where uh, men and women are sitting uh, together, but uh, he becomes rabbi of KI, a leading, probably in those days, the leading uh, conservative synagogue uh, in the area. He publishes a book, in a little booklet in 1930 called Hatsa'ah Lema'an Takanat Agunot, a proposal to, um, to free the agunot. There's, uh, so we don't want there to be all these agunos. Uh, husbands disappear. For many Orthodox rabbis, in the 90, even talking about a Hatzah proposal to free Agunos shows you that you're a reformer. I mean, that's uh, so even today the Haredi world, for many of them, they, any discussion of it. But we all know in the modern Orthodox world, there is a Hatzah. There's the RCA prenuptial agreement, which I'm going to argue was delayed for so many years precisely because of these internal disputes. If it wasn't for the long shadow of Lieberman and the rejection of his ketubah, orthodoxy would have adopted this uh, uh, solution long before. And it existed, it existed in Morocco already 30 years before. In fact, wait, I'll, I'll tell you it now and we'll get back to it. Norman Lamb, not just Norman Lamb, actually not Norman Lamb, uh, others, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Levinson, as I recall, and others in their criticism of the Lieberman ketubah say, how can you have such a stupid thing Man and woman are about to get married and you're speaking about what's going to happen if they get divorced? They thought it was uh, idiotic. And that's exactly what we all do. But it shows you this, they had to oppose anything that came from the conservative, even if it made sense, even if it was a good idea, you can argue. So uh, Lieberman maybe have a different proposal, but uh, you know, but since it came from the conservative, they had to reject it in bas mitzvah. In the modern Orthodox, not just modern Orthodox, lots of people have bas mitzvahs. When the bat mitzvah was first proposed, of course, the Orthodox had to condemn it and say it's terrible because it didn't come from the Orthodox. And that's a common phenomenon in which we will see. Had Epstein not got involved with this, maybe the Orthodox would have been able to come up with a solution. He later would publish, however, a great, a large book on this, which is still available on Hebrewbooks.org. Um, they haven't taken it down, uh, fortunately. Oops, and it's here it is. Oh, sorry, here it is. Lashelas Haguna, an entire volume of 
you see 258 pages, and he includes here also something from a Sephardic rabbi from Jerusalem, Vincent Alkali, who also has a, uh, a, a similar approach. Between the, his first Hatzah in 1930 and this volume in 1940, the, and this is also on HebrewBooks.org, incredibly, I downloaded it because as soon as someone uh, informs them that this is from Kinesia Taraba Name Hamerikaim, Shabbat Joshua Rabbanim, that's the rabbinical assembly. This is not orthodox. They'll take it down. But look where it comes from, this book. It comes from the library of Chabad. Because in Chabad Library, you have a great library in Crown Heights, they collect everything. And uh, this comes uh, uh, from their library. So this was published in 1936. And what is in this volume? This is uh, the rabbinical assembly is adopting the Hatzah of 1930, which Louis Epstein goes into great detail in his 1940 book. What is the Hatzah? <clears throat> that at the time of marriage, the husband will appoint his wife as his shaliach, as his agent. So if he ever disappears, she is his shaliach, and she will appoint a sofer, uh, will, will, will instruct the basin to write a get. There, been, there were a number of proposals. They call them uh, Kiddushin al Tanai, you know, marriage al Tanai. It's not, it's not really al Tanai, but because uh, you know you're allowed to appoint someone as your agent to write a get. So here you appoint someone to write a get. And then if you disappear, she has this authority. It's been done through the basin, and she can appoint them. And the rabbinical assembly in that booklet, which I just showed you at their convention, they said that we are going to adopt this proposal and we should, everyone should adopt this proposal and uh, this will solve the problem. Now the proposal never got off the ground, despite what the rabbinical assembly said, because Louis Ginsburg opposed it and also Michael Higger. Michael Higger was a Talmudist at the seminary, also typical yeshiva bacher who ends up at the seminary. He published um, all these little masechtas, masechta sofrim, sefer Torah, the, the, the minor masechtas, which were which are post-Talmudic. Uh, he published them and they're, they're the standard editions. Uh, they were opposed to it. Now, why were they opposed to it? Uh, I don't, as far as I know, we don't have in writing why they're opposed to it. There's two reasons you could be opposed to it. Either because it'll create a split between the Orthodox world and the conservative world, because if the Orthodox world starts uh, challenging the yichus, the lineage of the conservatives that are with the Jewish people. And there's also halachic reasons to be opposed, quite apart from the polemical reasons. And these halachic reasons, uh, you find them um, in an entire volume that was published by a British Rabbanim in America before Epstein's 1940 book, but after the, the proposal came out and the, the rabbinical assembly adopted it, Kolodora Haron, which uh, Hundreds of our rabbis sign on, you have Rechaim Ozer-Rosinski and Rav Cook, all opposing this uh, proposal. It's, there's problem, there are Orthodox rabbis who suggested similar things. Uh, the, the problem with all these proposals is after it's written, if the husband then sleeps with his wife, uh, it, it seems to, it could void the whole thing and there's other halachic problems. Uh, I don't want to get into the halachic disputes because uh, really, it's soon, if you read the arguments in the book, it doesn't even become a halachic issue. It's the idea of the chutzpah, as Rabbi Joseph Convitz, he was the president of Agudas Rabbanim, the son of the Ridbaz, says in Lador Acharon, he says that the students from Shechter's seminary, that's what they used to call the, the, the seminary, they called it Shechter's, he says that they have no shaychus, no connection to Rabbanus and to Psak. That is, who are these people? who spent uh, a few years uh, studying at the seminary, they're going to decide what is halacha. Now, granted, Epstein was a Tamil halacha. Everyone acknowledged this. In my um, booklet here, and also in an article in Yeshurin, uh, the authors cite uh, correspondence with, with Louis Epstein had with uh, lots of gedolim. He sent it to them, and uh, they corresponded with him. But for the rabbinical assembly, they're going to be deciding halacha to decide to change the way Jewish marriage law operates. You need to go to the gedolim Yisrael. You can't go to uh, you can't go to any local rabbi, not even a local Orthodox rabbi. Never mind uh, going to rabbis who are uh, not who are from Shachter Seminary. So here, by the mid '30s already, you have a break because you have conservative rabbis saying, "Well, it's not just that we're more open-minded and that we're the future because we're English-speaking and all that." No, they are willing. They're, they say they're willing to make changes in halacha. When I say make changes in halacha, I'm not talking about eating swordfish or anything like that. I'm talking about the most significant thing you can speak about, actual marriage, where if someone 
you think you're divorced and you're not divorced. That creates an adulterous situation and children mamzerim. Where do they get the uh, chutzpah to make decisions like that? So the Orthodox rabbinate decided it was when they the conservative rabbis just ministering at synagogues, they were not a threat. But now that they're putting themselves out as an alternative center of authority, that's when they need to be shut down. And the Agudas Rabbanim in America, which is fighting the battle, they're on the front lines. And they're already seeing in the 30s conservative synagogues without machitzas. Now, granted, their synagogues don't have machitzas either, many of them, the Orthodox synagogues, but the conservative rabbis are starting to justify it and saying that it's permissible. The Orthodox rabbis weren't justifying it. It was like, Nebuch, what can you do? But uh, we don't want to lose these shuls, so we'll keep an Orthodox rabbi there. But I'll read to you what Louis Ginsburg has to say about machitzas in a minute. And then they get the, the rabbis from all over the world sign on to it. So the battle, there's now a battle between the, the old-fashioned rabbis, not just the old-fashioned, Rabbi Zev Gold signed the, the document as well. All the Orthodox rabbis, I would say, in America, led by the old-fashioned Agudas Rabbani rabbis, but they're the real Tamil coming from Europe, against the conservative movement. And lo and behold, what happens? Right during this conflict, uh, Shaul Lieberman, who is from the old-style Tamil Chachamim, he shows up in New York, and now he's giving, he's not like Ginsburg. Ginsburg had left uh, the Torah world, uh, uh, as it's understood in orthodoxy. And Lieberman shows up uh, at the seminary. Now, why did the conservative rabbis think that they could involve themselves in halachic matters like this? I found, uh, I went through to, when I did Shaul so Lieberman Orthodox, I, every day, I would devote an hour to going through Hapardes. Hapardes is the, the, the monthly. It came out every single month. Hapardes is great uh, because it had the, just the advertisements and the discussions. Uh, I'm going to be using this uh, an enormous amount if I ever get around to my book on the halacha history of the United States. I'm going to have to deal with the whole machitza business as well, uh, um, halacha disputes. I'll get to the machitza in a little while. Uh, I have some good stuff to show you. But uh, a Pardes would come out every month, and that was the magazine, the journal, the Torah journal of the Agudas Rabbanim, and all the Gadolim wrote it. That's where Salvatric wrote his first pieces, when his father wanted to show him as, uh, show the world who his son, the great Gaon is. Uh, he published pieces in Apardes, and you had editorials in Apardes. Um, the best thing about Apardes are the ads, I think. Uh, you have, like, for things today we wouldn't dream of eating, uh, the different gelatin products, all these things. I'll, in my next farm blog post, I'm going to have a whole discussion uh, about this. Um, um, and I'll use pictures from Apardes. But Apardes has editorials in which the editor, first was Rabbi Pardes, later becomes Rabbi Simcha Elberg. That's why it's called Apardes, because it was Rabbi Shmua Pardes. He was uh, a rav in Chicago. He was the editor. And this is what he explains. Listen to this. So, so again, so every day I'd go through, or every day I had a chance, an hour going through all the Apardeses. And that's, if you notice in the book, and I'm quoting different things from Apardes, how do I know all this? Because I'd go through it, and uh, it was full of information about uh, the Orthodox conservative dispute, and also the dispute between Agudas Rabbanim and the OU. Agudas Rabbanim was saying that you can't trust the OU's hashkacha. How can you eat the OU? OU synagogues don't have machitzas. You can eat OU hashkacha? How is that possible? So uh, you see, uh, you learn an enormous amount about... Um, uh, orthodoxy, uh, the sort of information that if you look at Gurak's wonderful book on uh, orthodoxy in America, he doesn't access that. That's not the sort of thing he's interested in. So there's still room, especially since I want to focus on halacha. I've already done about, uh, I'm, I'm too busy with other stuff, but I've done about 25 pages on conversion in America and uh, the different approaches in America to the rabbis of conversion. So uh, there's a lot to do. But getting back to this Hapardes, so the Hapardis of the Torah says as follows. It asks the question, where do the conservative rabbis think that they can decide all questions? Quote, we, that is us, Rabbani, we must confess and say we are guilty. They are found among us rabbis who respect them, who come together with them to be Masadar Kedushin or in other gatherings. So Rabbi Pardes is saying that we have Orthodox rabbis who will jointly be Masadar Kedushin with a conservative rabbi. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute to make you see this. There are those of us who enter their synagogues. I can tell you that in Scranton, Rabbi Guterman, Rabbi Guterman, he'd come occasionally and do Bechina, get Bechinas at YU. He's an old Sabotka Rav. He comes to Scranton. He's in Scranton like 50 years. Uh, there's a picture of him in the, uh, in the JCC because he was beloved, but he, uh, he refused to step foot in, uh, in the synagogue, uh, the conservative synagogue. Uh, there are those of us, listen to this, there are those of us who educated our children in their seminary. I don't know what that means. I mean, there's a lot of 
people who, a lot of children of these rabbis who went to the seminary, I don't know what it means that we educated. I think the reality is the children went. I don't think the fathers were so happy, but it doesn't mean they all were so unhappy. So for example, Rabbi Geffen, famous Rabbi Geffen from Atlanta, who gives the hashkacha on Coca-Cola. Well, he has a bunch of grandchildren who became conservative rabbis. He went to the smicha, at least he went to one of the smicha at the seminary. The sense was that many of the old time rabbis they came to terms with the fact that their children were going in a more liberal route. Uh, Rabbi Ephraim Epstein from uh, Chicago. His son, Harry, Svi, he learns in Hebron, in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, in Hebron, comes back to America, becomes uh, there's an Orthodox Muslim, becomes a conservative rabbi. It, it, it was the era, and they became much more accepting of it. Uh, there are those of us who educated our children in their seminary, and this is what brought about their chutzpah to establish themselves as rabbis, to rule in halachot of Gittin and Kiddushin. In other words, the Orthodox rabbis are treating them like, like colleagues. They're being Messiah Kiddushin with them. So can you blame the conservative rabbis for thinking, well, uh, we too can decide halacha. I want to show you, since he mentions being the Sadr Kiddushin, I, I, I have this picture just because I, I've had it for a little while. I wanted to show you walking down the aisles. Remember, I showed you the rabbis walking down the aisle, but it just occurred to me as I'm speaking, it's not just walking down the aisle. Uh, I can show you something else. Uh, let's see. Uh, you know, I got to, oops. Oh, I got to pull it up again. Hold on. Um, um, Oh boy. Oh, where is it? Hold on. You're going to want to see this. I, I just got to pull it up on the computer, right? Uh, unless I have it here for you. Uh, oh, I have it here for you. Here, let me show you. It was an article long, about a year ago or something. No, more than a year ago. Um, how many years ago was it? Oh, it's it seven years ago in the um, Jewish link. But uh, Look at this picture. It's a, the article is how to love by an Orthodox Jew. He claims to be right-wing Orthodox. How to love conservative form Hasidic reconstructionist Jews. And he shows a picture of his wedding. And uh, here you have uh, in the middle, the Boston Rebbe. That on the right is Rapincha Stolper from the OU. And that on the left, uh, his name is Rabbi Stanley Steinhardt from the Jericho Jewish Center. I, I, I don't know him, but he's a conservative rabbi. Now here, what's interesting, first of all, is they're walking down the aisle. I told you this already, I, that they used to walk down the aisles before the chuppah. Uh, and I, I'd like to know when this stopped and are there any weddings today where we give the rabbis the covet of walking down the aisle? I, I haven't seen it. Now notice also, this is, uh, I guess it would be the 60s. Um, they're um, still men and women. And you can see they're not the most orthodox. If you look on the right, just look at the keypads. They're the ones they grabbed when they came in. Uh, but men and women uh, are sitting separately. But here you have the Boston Rebbe. Let me see if it says uh, the year of his, uh, 1965, yeah. So here you have the Boston Rebbe doing exactly what Aparde says is the problem. He's being Masada Kedushin together with the uh, conservative rabbi. But I tell you, a Nemana, because I'm an eyewitness. Uh, I don't need to say the names, but uh, I, I could tell if anyone's interested later. I was at a wedding where a conservative rabbi, the father of the groom, was Masada Kedushin and Rav Aaron Soloveitchik, who was related to the Kala. Either he was a witness or he read the Ketubah. He was under the Chuppah. And Rav Aaron Soloveitchik was so, he was even harsher against the conservative, at least uh, in a polemical sense, than Rabbi Soloveitchik. Rav Aaron Soloveitchik in Chicago refused to allow the non-Orthodox to use the mikvah for their conversions. And this created a huge dispute. The Telzi Shiva held in Chicago, you could do it. And Ramosha Feinstein held that uh, you could allow them if they contribute money or if it's going to create a conflict in the community, that sort of thing. Uh, what do we care if they use it? Uh, but Ravar and Soloveitchik thought it was, it was uh, creates a falsehood to the Torah. And he had, there was a whole machokas here. And the, uh, the people went to Ramosha. After Ravaron said no, they went to Ramosha. And then the, the people behind this as is reported by Rav uh, Aaron's son in a volume he published, was the people in the Tel's yeshiva, because I guess they didn't want to get into conflict with the non-Orthodox. Uh, so Rav Aaron was Masada Kedushin together, so obviously he felt it wasn't such an issue. And even Hapardes, I tell you, and this is one of the great discoveries I found going through the Hapardes, Hapardes was also guilty 
Why do I say Hapardes is guilty? Take a look at this. Hapardes, 1931. A little Torah note here. Who's the author of it? Eliezer Aryeh Halevi, Amahuna Dr. Finkelstein, New York. This is Louis Finkelstein at the time teaching at the seminary. Uh, and uh, he, he's a graduate of the seminary. He's publishing a Torah article in, um, in Apardes. So uh, he had been teaching, not only had he taught at the seminary since 24, he was the president of the rabbinical assembly from 28 to 1930, and Hapardes published his piece. So you're going to say, well, maybe they did it as a favor to his father, who was a, a well-known rav uh, in New York. Doesn't matter. Hapardes is publishing Chidushe Torah from someone identified with the conservative movement. So this shows us and how things were, and that the so-called guilt is completely understandable, because as we will see, and we're going to focus on this at least the beginning of the next class, the designation orthodox and conservative doesn't denote, there's no fundamental difference among most American Jews and most American congregations, uh, even among many of the rabbis. It's hard to know the difference, and it's precisely the, Lieber, the, the Epstein proposal and the fact that the conservative movement, at least the rabbis, um, the, said that they're going to independently begin to make all the decisions, that finally opens up the eyes of the Orthodox rabbis that uh, although our synagogues look the same, there is a difference. And that this movement, which wasn't really a movement, but uh, now they're starting to seeing it as a sort of breakaway, that this is dangerous. But my argument in Saul Lieberman and the Orthodox, which subsequently I've become convinced of it even more for, through other pieces of evidence, is that until the mid 1930s, the Eps and the Epstein proposal? Until the Epstein proposal, um, there was no understanding that this is a heretical group. Yeah, you have uh, people who are doing things we don't like, but this isn't a group that we need to battle. On the contrary, the thinking is that we could uh, live with them, especially the traditionalists among them. Uh, there's good conservative, there's not, but now all of a sudden the conservative movement. The whole conservative movement, even if you're a conservative rabbi who's completely Shomer Torah mitzvos, you are going to now be grouped as belonging to a sectarian heterodox group. And then, then we can really speak about a new denomination, conservative Judaism. We'll have three denominations then, orthodoxy, conservative reform. We'll talk about reconstructionism later, because one of the leaders of conservative Judaism is actually Mordechai Kaplan. Uh, so that, that's the argument of Saul Lieberman and the Orthodox, that the, uh, the Epstein proposal is what really creates the break. And the, really, it forces the, uh, the Orthodox to recognize that this is a different denomination with a different approach. But this is before the driving to Shab, Shul on Shabbos, Shuva. It's before electricity. It's before a lot of things. It's, it's a time when um, the differences were very minor and um, the Orthodox rabbis never imagined that the conservative rabbis would make far-reaching halakhic decisions. Just like the typical Orthodox rabbi doesn't make halakhic decisions, he goes to the post scheme, so too the conservative rabbis go. So we will pick up with that next class. We'll speak about um, more, especially taking us into the 50s, uh, what, what's with this orthodoxy and uh, not, what's an orthodox shulden? If you don't have the machitz, I'll speak more about traditional Judaism. Um, and um, I'll read you some of the material from Louis Ginsburg because uh, he, it's quite interesting what he has to say about uh, mixed seating. And then I'll show you a picture that one of the people who's with us has for me. You'll see how they davened at the seminary. And uh, okay, well, lots more good stuff. Uh, let me now take... Um, some of the questions here, we, we did a lot today. And um, again, I still have to get to uh, some of the, oh, I, and I'll get to this next week, Billy uh, Nedder. One of you wants to know why I quote Daniel Boyarin, why I haven't put him in Khairam, and that he can't be quoted uh, because of his politics. And then his politics are abhorrent. But uh, I will explain to you why, uh, not just myself, Tablet, which is uh, right wing, why, uh, and I also claim that he's not the problem. Peter Beinart. Let me, I'll talk about Peter Beinart next week, but uh, let me get to the questions. Uh, um, and yes, uh, someone privately emails me that we lost from David Eliach um, uh, from Yeshiva Flatbush um, uh, Thursday night, 99 years old, uh, the husband of Yafa Eliach, the great um, 
author of the wonderful book. If you haven't read it, Shabbos reading, uh, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. Uh, it's so classic. Then, of course, she wrote a book on Aisha Shuk, uh, that's, that's her town. I brought her to University of Scranton once to speak about her relationship with the Pope. She had a relationship with Pope uh, John Paul II. She had a relationship with, and uh, it's, it's a brilliant family. I actually have to, I should say now, Hakara Tatov to uh, Rabbi Eliach. Uh, when I did not have a job, when I came out of Harvard Graduate School for the first year, I didn't have a job. So I thought maybe I teach at, uh, at uh, one of the schools in the New York area. Uh, one of the yeshivas. After all, I'm a Harvard PhD. I can uh, teach Jewish history and things like that. And what I'm going to say now is, I, I guess, an indictment maybe of our day school, of our high schools then. I'm not saying now. This is 1995. I sent my resume out to every single Orthodox high school in the New York area. And only two of them replied to me. Here I am, Harvard PhD, Musmach, writing that uh, only two of them. One was Ramaz. And the other was Yeshiva Fatsh. And uh, although uh, the problem was I couldn't teach Yeshiva, I told Rabbi Eliach that uh, the typical Yeshiva guy, he, he, he basically offered me the job right there, but he said, I have to teach in Ivrit. And I said to him, I have to be honest, my Ivrit is, uh, I can speak maybe a little Lashon Kodesh, but Ivrit is the way he wants it. I don't think I could do it. So his attitude was, well, then come back to me when you know Ivrit. Uh, Ramaz, uh, of course, had no problem. But I, the fact that, that that to me was very disappointing because uh, not even to interview me, not even to talk to me. What are all these schools you have in New York area? Don't they want to impress their uh their parents that say that now uh, teaching in our Jewish history is uh, Mark Shapiro, Harvard PhD, I would think that that would be, uh, uh, but whatever. Um, so um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a loss. Um, Rabbi y uh, Yaakov Yellen says that you say Ramosha was not afraid either. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think so generally. And we know that the Satmar, the terrible stuff they did to him, he was never afraid about that shuva. 100% not about that shuva, but I, 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 as a Talmud of his, okay, so I take uh, your word that he was uh, not afraid either. Um, but if you read the Masoras Moshe, there are some times there where you get the sense that he didn't want to mess with uh, some of these crazies. And his attitude was, uh, you know, we don't need to mess with them. Uh, and maybe it's just a personality thing. Rabbi Tenler, uh, maybe he enjoyed messing with them. I don't know, but uh, um the issue of Hakira, the one that just came out, the, the, the last one, the latest one, whatever it is, um, it's uh, here. Volume 30. I was Someone so in, responded. I'm 30, 30, 2021. Yeah, I was, so, there's three things from the Rav here, four things. Where we saw the remark at the Hanukkah Sabayas, the Talmud Shtibol, the Rav at Revel, the Rav at Ritz. Rabbi Salvatius portrayal of the patriarchs. I was so uh, inspired when I read this. I have a lot of letters of the rough. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, like uh, 10 significant letters, which I've discovered over the years. And I had said that I was going to publish them in Israel. There's a journal uh, edited by Dove Schwartz. Uh, Dove Schwartz, he's one of these people who published an enormous amount. I think he has two books on the Rav, but they published a number of letters of the Rav. But after seeing this, uh, I'd rather publish it in Hakira, which is read by thousands of people, than publish it in a journal put up by, an annual put up by Bar Ilan, which only some academics see. So I, uh, I told the Hakira people that uh, I'm gonna be sending them these, uh, these letters. Yeah. You can believe it. The I won't tell which archive, because I don't want someone to scoop me, but the, the place I found it, they wanna charge me 120 shekels, I guess that's called $40 or something, 120 shekels, whatever it is, um, um, for, to publish each document. I'll tell you what 120 shekels is. $37 for each document. I think that's outrageous. The job of a library, especially if you're an archive at a library or an archive anywhere, is supposed to find if you make copy pages, you pay, but to charge for your, your, your holdings at the library there are supposed to be for the public. And so I have 10 letters here and they want to charge me. So I'm, I'll get the money from the University of Scranton. Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll get it from them. But still, I, I think that's outrageous. 120 shekels um, uh, for this. Um. Rav Shaptai is married to, uh, well, I know he's married to Rav Tenger's daughter. I've showed the wedding picture uh, already. I didn't know which one because uh, I don't know the family really well. Um, all I can say is, call Kavo to Hakira. They can, they're able to, consistently come out with very interesting uh, issues. So.
Rabbi Shudnow says that he was together for a tenure in Newport, Rhode Island at the Navy. He and Rabbi Macy Gordon perform morality and values training for all chaplains. And Rabbi Lieberman and Finkelstein and Rafa'ur were my blessed teachers, yes. Uh, Rabbi Temler was not so tolerant uh, of, uh, if you look, of, of people from even Shomri Torah Mitzvahs from the seminary, though. He has a debate in tradition in the uh, early 70s, I think it is, with Rabbi David Feldman. Rabbi David Feldman was a completely observant Jew, a Talmud Chacham of the first caliber, who educated his kids in accordance with uh, traditional Orthodox values, the sons of Rosh Hashiva, not YU. When they, they have a debate about... Uh, of it's abortion or birth control, something like that. And Rabbi Tendler insists on referring to him as Reverend Feldman. So, but, uh, but again, it's, he's an equal opportunity, right? Uh, he would uh, go after Orthodox rabbis also, certainly. Vogel Wirt says that Elisha is now associated with Emery, Shirim and Halacha, Shubat Rishonim, or Amarku. If he's associated with Emery, it's very recent, because as of last year, I believe, he still was uh, in, in Israel. Rabbi Shudnow says in Chicago, the CRC and HTC created traditional synagogues. Yes, I'll speak about that next class uh, because I'm going to talk about the phenomenon. And I, uh, I went, uh, I'll tell you what Rabbi Elif told me about the traditional movement. I need to know about this because I want to write about it. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much to write about, but he sent me, uh, there's not much in written literature. I've expressed the, the assumption that a lot of these traditional synagogues, because they had Orthodox rabbis, would eventually turn orthodox. But that's that could be just impressionistic. It needs to be documented that that's the case. So we will speak next class about this and um, um, because then that becomes a breaking point also between orthodox and conservative. Rabbi Kelman says for many years, uh, the Shari Shamayim in Montreal was conservative with a machitza. It had conservative rabbis. Without, uh, and Rabbi with, was orthodox. Um, Rabbi, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Shushat whose yeah. son you may know, he was yes. the rabbi for many, many years. And then Barry Gelman was there temporarily for, I mean, temporarily. Oh, no, temporary. for, so why do you call it, but it was associated with- No, no, for years. many years, it was, uh, I believe, a member of the United Synagogue. Somebody says you're not, but I'm for 95% sure he's a member of the United Synagogue with the Mechitza, with, with and, the Mechitza. And by the way, he, uh, Rav Cook went to that synagogue, as I recall, when he came to Montreal in 19. Uh, it's the most prestigious shul. It's Westmount. That's where all the fans, you know, Bronfman's were members there. It's a very prestigious, beautiful shul. Um, anyways, but, but I should uh, now say that the, R the RA Committee on Jewish Law became the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards. Standards meant non halachic. Next class, I'll, I'm going to describe to you a little about the halachic tshuva. And uh, we, we mentioned Rabbi, I mean, the Shabbos tshuva, we mentioned Rabbi Gordas, Robert Gordas last class. I'll tell you what he wrote in response to this. And um, wait till you hear who wrote the, uh, the tshuva, the, the, the three people who wrote the tshuva that permitted driving on Shabbos. One of them, just to uh, whet your appetite, was not just a Talmud, a Talmud Mufhak of Ramosha Salavechik, who not only received smicha, who remained two extra years at Reitz to get a yodin yodin. Talmud Mufhak, the Rav was his Masader Kiddushin. He learned with the Rav privately in Boston. Does anyone know who I'm talking about before I speak around next week? One of the three authors was, uh, was considered one of the future greats of orthodoxy, one of the most greatest Tamil Chachamim to come out of Ritz in the Revel era before he comes under the influence of, um, of Mordechai Kaplan in particular. So we will talk about his, to give a hint, his brother was professor at YU. Professor of Jewish history, his younger brother. So we will get to him uh, next class. So, yes, the first part, Mrs. Mordechai Kaplan's. Uh, Rabbi Kelman, today it's officially unaffiliated, though brands itself is Orthodox. I do not believe. Okay, you're speaking about the, uh, okay, the Montreal show. Yes, I know the book Tradition and Change. Yes. Uh, um, Professor Fa'ur Rashino says a senior Talmudist did not attend graduations at the seminary. Oh, that I didn't know. Uh, um, Rabbi now says that Rabbi Soloveitchik had to leave HTC when he refused to sign smichas of students who would take the traditional mixed seating shuls. That was definitely one of the things that led to the conflict. But um, I showed you some stuff about this last semester, if you remember. But I have all the private material about this. And uh, there were other stuff as well. Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik thought that as the Rosh Yeshiva, he should be in charge of everything. The problem was that, first of all, there's a president, and the president of uh, HTC, HTC thought that he should be in charge. And there were also other rabbin there. You had uh, other rabbin there, and they did not feel that uh, that they should take orders from a viral. So it created a lot of controversy. And the um, 
the signing, the allowing them to take shoals with uh, mixed seating shoals, that was just added fuel to the fire. Uh, someone privately he texts me that in the Safer, the uh, Jubilee volume for Shimon Shkup, there's a letter from Professor Davidson. Uh, Professor Davidson, who taught at the seminary, a great uh, scholar of uh, poetry, um, he raised a lot of money for Shimon Shkup's yeshiva. As I recall, he went there, uh, but uh, Rav Shimon Shkup, when he came to America, even went to the seminary and to, he, to visit with him, and uh, he helped him a great deal. So it makes sense. Justin Hornsey said, Rosovich had many friends, not of the rabbinic cadre. He was close to the Boston, Brooklyn, Bali, Bali, and cherished a friendship. Yes, but the difference is, that when I said real friends, these were people who looked up to the Rav as the God of Ador. They, they would never call him by his first name. The, Rav, the Lieberman, I'm assuming, when they were private together, he called him Beryl. Although Rabbi Shudna wouldn't call him by his first name either. But when you're at that level of the Rav to have friends of the sort, those are the people you have in your youth. It's very hard uh, when, you're, when the people meet you, when you're already at that level, uh, you can only really have close friends with people at your own level. So these are, these are tough and, and they don't shoot the breeze either. It's not the same sort of thing. But Rabbi Shudna, uh, you read the way the Rav describes how, how what, he, he saw him as a loyal friend. Uh, of course, Rabbi Shudnow uh, was the one who wrote the only time that a, uh, uh, an English article appeared in Hapardi. See, Rabbi Rakefet some time ago gave a talk on this thing, and he said the only time a conservative rabbi appeared in Hapardi. It's not true. I just showed you uh, uh, Louis Finkelstein. But the only time you had an English um, piece in Hapardi was after the rov was cleared by uh, the judge in Boston. He had been accused of all sorts of shenanigans and kosherish was, by the way, uh, Orthodox rabbis were instigators of this, including one name in particular that uh, is pretty well known. Uh, I don't need to mention it right now, uh, especially since later they um, apparently made shalom. But uh, Rabbi Shudna, not Rabbi Shudna, Rabbi Shuba was a, um, a big backer of Soloveitchik, and uh, he wrote this uh, long uh, article there explaining how uh, the Rav was uh, being persecuted. These rabbis, these Orthodox rabbis didn't want the Rav to come in and overshadow them and uh, run the show and also to clean up Kashras. Kashras was a big, uh, was in a scandalous state and the Rav was coming in to clean up Kashras and uh, that would affect their Parnassa. So uh, there were a group of Orthodox rabbis in Boston who, first of all, they resented this idea. The Rav was a uh, number of shows created a position. They called the Rav the chief rabbi of Boston. Who made the Rav chief rabbi of Boston? They think they're uh, rabbi of Boston. So um, yeah. Um, Amalia asked, the police comment on the idea that Ezra Snashim in the base of Midrash was not the women's section, but the social hall. So maybe there's no valid reason for the Mechitza, which doesn't seem to have agreed on dimensions. Wait till next class, because I will tell you about a well-known rabbi in America, a posek, an author of Sfarim, who argues basically what you're argues similar to what you're saying, that you don't need a Mechitza, even in Dalvani. He tries to provide a halachic justification. And wait till you hear what Ramosha Feinstein says, says to him. I'll do that next class. Rabbi Green, yeshivas are not impressed with Harvard degrees. Yes, but I wasn't sending to yeshivas. I was sending to these um, modern Orthodox high schools that, that call themselves yeshivas, but some of them are no different in prep schools. And they all, many of them, if you look at how they advertise themselves, they're more interested in advertising how many kids they get into the Ivy League schools than how they get into, uh, than how many go to Israel. So uh, they, um, it, it just shows, I think, that they're, 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 they're small thinking. Remember that Rabbi, Rabbi Green says, remember that uh, Schechter and Finkelstein called the congregation in, in organization United Synagogues, perhaps emulating what they recognize as modern orthodoxy in England. Perhaps, uh, they, they, they um, for them it was, just, it was an organization. It wasn't, uh, it had nothing to do with ritual or anything like that. Uh, Rabbi Shudnow says, Rabbi Feldman and I were listed as orthodox and Jewish values online, not only us. Rabbi Feldman, who I knew, not only did I know him, I spent Shabbos together with him, Torah in Motion. Um, should I say it? Torah in Motion had scholar in residence, myself and Rabbi Feldman, and spending Shabbos with Rabbi Feldman. And he spoke at the traditional synagogues, which they still have in Toronto, uh, non egalitarian. But uh, what a delight to spend it with Rabbi Feldman. We had, we had him and his daughter and son, Rav Daniel, yeah. came. That was a different time. Weekend. That was a different time. Yeah. So, I, all, yeah. so okay. I asked him, I asked Rabbi Feldman, why did you go to the seminary? He already had Orthodox Smicha. He came, his father was a big Rav. 
His father was a rabbi in Los Angeles, as I recall. His father wrote a sefer in the Torah to Mima. And Rabbi Feldman said to me that um, that's what we thought the future was. And I can tell you that by the end of his life, uh, someone I know uh, was at one of the rabbinical assembly uh, conventions at one of the hotels, and they're talking about whatever they talk about. And Rabbi Feldman gets up almost crying and saying, what are you talking about? What about Shabbos? What about Kashras? Uh, you know, this is what we should be speaking about. So we know we're going to get to the end of the story is that and Lieberman is part of this story, that all these hopes and dreams, that this is the future and everything, with the Gerson Cohen assumption of authority and the changes in the seminary, that leads to the great break and the great disappointment that the, those conservative rabbis who were committed to halacha and saw the movement as a halachic movement just maybe a little more lenient uh, than the orthodox, uh, they're no longer was pretending anymore, and the, 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 we have some of them with us online with us now. And of course, there's Rabbi Novak, and there's Rabbi Halivni, and Rabbi Faor. Well, he was not even part of it, but he could be he was teacher of it. And so many others, they formed the Union of Traditional Judaism, uh, which I did not, well, we, well, we'll get to that. And there's the letter, which I published here in um, Saul Lieberman Orthodox, because they turned to their Rebbe, Rashal Lieberman, and Rashal Lieberman writes them a letter encouraging them, and then he authors the tshuva about, and this is what everything broke down over this, to a certain extent, of women rabbis. So we'll get to all this. Uh, uh, someone privately emails me that Rabbi Shuba's brother was the judge. No, no, Rabbi Shuba's brother was not the judge. The judge was someone, he was Jewish, but he was someone else. So uh, I don't know, Rabbi Kelman, who this Grammy is. So, oh, oh, the, 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 someone they give to the Grammy to be a good word. I think it's an American word. Maybe it's a Canadian word. I don't even know. But they say that the, he won the award because of the choir in Shar Shemayim, which was his shul. That was his family shul. Okay. Ah, oh, Judge Abraham. Oh, because somebody pointed out oh, that okay, his okay. ancestors, William, Bill Goritz was pointing out his ancestors were the presidents of the shul. Yeah, he was a member of the shul. Leonard Cohen was a member of Shar Shemayim. Oh, yes, Leonard Cohen, exactly. Um, uh, and finally, the last comment, uh, Rabbi Feldman's father said in shows on Friday evening, say, have dollar right after kid. Okay. Listen, we know that there was, uh, <laughs> I'll leave it to the people to fight. I don't need to get involved with those uh, disputes. But I, I thank you all, um, Rabbi Kelman. Thank, thank you. you okay, we look forward to next week, always leaving us with uh, more information to come. And uh, we'll forth next week and uh, in between to, to learning with you during the week, like I mentioned at, at the beginning, tomorrow morning, uh, Rachel Dan Sharansky Danziger begins her series on relationships in the book of Bereshit. That's tomorrow at 11 a.m. And Thursday, Shuli Mishkin begins her series. All we have the Parsha here this week will be given by Rabbi Rabbi Nachbar from from Tinak. David Nachbar teaches at, at GPATS and at, at TABC. And I'll be giving, of course, my uh, that I started last week a close look at the sitter on Friday morning. Sunday, Rabbi Leaptag begins his new series on. Uh, on number seven and creation and uh, that'll be Sunday. And then uh, we'll continuing with a few more classes. I do, I will let people know it's not on the website yet because we just sort of did it uh, from Joseph Car Carmel from the Rush Call of Eretz Chem. I don't know if people know him. He's really a fantastic, he's a major, uh, major person in Israel and uh, a, a really clear articulate speaker. We'll be giving a series, uh, probably a six part series, but Ivrit. We're going to do an Ivrit before we've had individual classes in Hebrew, but this will be the first time we're going to do a whole series in Ivrit. So hopefully uh, people will come, will be interested. We'll we'll let you know. We haven't finalized the date yet, but um, just to let you know in advance, we have a couple more classes. So uh, always want to hear, like I say, uh, I always want to hear ideas and suggestions and uh, any critique and ways for improvement. I always want to hear and uh, do invite your friends and we look forward to learning with you and everybody have a wonderful night and a wonderful week and uh, all good things. And we look forward to seeing you in the near future. Lila Tov, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.